Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Tonight, I believe that God has a word for you and I. There's been a scripture that's been rolling around in my spirit for weeks now. I've been, I've been hearing myself say it in my prayer time, and it's one of those scriptures that I learned early on and have tried to just incorporate into my life. And I believe that you're going to be blessed by it tonight as we get into the word of the Lord. And really, uh, kind of on Sunday nights, I'd like to do a little series on it. If I'm teaching on Sunday nights, we'll, we'll be in this verse and getting, digging into the word of God, so it's going to be good. But, you know, you didn't come tonight to hear from me. Oh, thank God you didn't come to hear from me because I don't really have much to say. You didn't come to hear from a man or a woman. It's not about hearing from the young or the old, the black, the brown, the white, any other color you could imagine. This is about us coming together and hearing from the Holy Spirit, hearing from God. So tonight, let's prepare our hearts. I'm going to ask you guys to stand to your feet. I'm going to get down on my knees, and let's go before the Lord together in prayer and invite the Holy Spirit to come and to be our teacher. Father, we come to you tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we give you thanks. We give you praise. For who you are and what you've already done in this church service, God, we just welcome your presence tonight, God, and are so glad that you're here with us. And tonight, Father, we would ask that you would come and speak to us by your Holy Spirit. Come and be our teacher, be our guide. Give us the vision, the wisdom, the direction that we need for each and every one of our individual lives. Lord, my prayer tonight is that you would say things to individuals and to hearts, to lives, God, that I didn't even say, Lord. May may this church be the good ground where the word is sown tonight. May it go deep into our hearts and take root. May we receive it with meekness and with joy. And Father God, we pray that you open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to understand. May we be that good ground where the word is sown. May it produce fruit in each and every one of our lives. God, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor for that. And Lord, also, we would remember our brothers and sisters in the Lord that are preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. They're our brothers and sisters, Lord. We love them. We don't think of ourselves as any better than anybody, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom. Bless them tonight, Lord, as you would bless us. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, and we say Amen. amen. You may be seated. And tonight I want to talk to you about a subject called Guidelines for Living. You know, we all need guidelines. It's like driving on the road. If we didn't have guidelines, we'd all crash into each other. We'd all have a a difficult time. In fact, kind of a funny thing, my uncle was driving one time with a friend, and he was driving in the middle of the road, and his friend said, what are you doing? He said, well, I pay my taxes. I get half the road, and therefore I want the middle half. But see, those lines are there for a reason. They're there to keep us going in a certain direction. They're there to keep us safe. They're there to, to benefit us and, and make sure that we're able to do life together and to do life a certain way. And, and don't you know that God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who, who penned the plan of redemption, carried it out in his son here on the earth, and now the one who is seated at the right hand of God, God has a plan for our life. God has desires for our life. God wants our life to be blessed, and God wants our life to be a certain way, and therefore God provides for you and I guidelines, almost markers on the road of life as we walk and as we go, not only to keep us going in the right direction, but also to keep us from crashing, to keep us from from running into something that we shouldn't, to keep us in line, if you will. And it's not really just because God's some egotist or some legalistic freak in the sky that just wants to rule and dominate your life. No, God knows what's good for you and I. God knows how things work, and God sees the road ahead, and therefore he provides guidelines to keep us safe, to benefit us, to bless us, and to keep us going. Uh, I would like for you to open your Bibles tonight to the book of Micah, Old Testament, prophet Micah. In fact, I have a son named Micah. He's my middle child. And we're going to go to Micah chapter number 6. In Micah chapter number 6, some of you guys could sing this verse if you've been around church for a while. I know I could. We used to sing this one when I was growing up. Micah chapter 6, verse number 8, we find some guidelines for living. Micah chapter number 6, verse number 8 says this. It says, He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? Oftentimes people say, what is it that God wants from me? What, how does God want me to live? How does God want me to do life? And, and as we read the rest of this verse, we're going to see. He has shown you, old man. He, he's painted some lines on the ground. He's made some guidelines for you and I. Guidelines for living. He's shown you, old man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? And now he answers the question. Look at this. But to do justly, to love mercy... And to walk humbly with your God. 
These are the guidelines that God provides in Micah chapter 6, verse number 8 for you and I. As we look at these things, we see three things there. Now, tonight I could have just ran through them and gone through all three real fast and kind of gave you an overview. But I really feel like uh, if we spent some time and, and really dug deep and dug into these things, that it will benefit us and it will bless us because God's word is not fast food meant to be devoured. God's, God's word is like a, a choice meal. It's like sitting down at a steakhouse. You know, you ever wonder why they give you those little teeny tiny pieces of meat at an expensive steakhouse? Well, because it's worth it to slow down to take your time and to actually taste what they're doing with that food. As you do, you realize, my goodness, you get this little teeny tiny piece on your fork and you put it in your mouth and you chew it and, oh, my goodness, flavors are bursting out everywhere and you can taste the, the salt and the pepper and the different spices that they used and, and you can tell that they had it in there for a certain amount of time. It's hot, it's, but, but, but yet it still is, is juicy and, and, oh, my goodness, we're all hungry now. Let's get back to the word of the Lord. He has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Tonight, I want to talk to you about one of the guidelines for living, and that is to do justly. To do justly. The Bible tells us that the Lord loves justice. In fact, you read that several times in your Bible, that you, O Lord, love justice. My goodness, God loves justice. And it also says that God will cause justice to shine like the noonday. Think about that for a second. God will cause justice to shine like the noonday. If you walked outside today in the, in the 100 degree plus weather wherever you were at and you took a look up at the sun, your eyes would start to squint and eventually close. Why? Because it was so bright, so vibrant, so hot that you, you almost couldn't stand up under that, that weight and that heat and, and that brightness. God says that he will cause his justice to shine Like the noonday. So the question for you and I is, what is justice? What is justice? You know, we we have some concepts. We think about it. Oh, well, when somebody who is wrong gets punished, you know, or or, or they catch the criminal and they lock him up, that's justice. Somebody was wrong, somebody was defrauded, and therefore they went and, and, and somebody made it right on their behalf, and that was justice. And that's okay, and that's a, that's a very worldly understanding. But listen, when we approach the Word of God and we find out that God is a just God and that God loves justice, it, 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 we've got to approach it in a different sense. What is justice? Justice is simply this, when the plan of God is carried out. Why? Because God is just. And whatever God says is right. Even though we may not like it, Oftentimes it doesn't fit into our thinking or the way we calculate data that we, that we accumulate. We see things and we add one plus one and we say, well, one plus one, well, that, that definitely equals two. And God comes along and says, no, I don't want it this time to equal two. I want it to equal four. And you say, but God, that's not right. And God says, but I'm just. And we say, but God, that's not fair. Everybody else got one plus one and that's two. How come when they get one plus one, it equals four? And God says, because I'm just. And we would want to come and argue with God and say, God, but wait a second. God, this doesn't calculate. This doesn't compute. I don't understand. And God is saying simply whatever I say goes. Why? Because he's God. He can do that. The one who speaks in planets exists. If he says something about your or my life, therefore it's just, it's right, it's good, and it's fair according to what God says. And listen, when God settles accounts, when we wrap this whole thing up, God is just and the justifier, the Bible says. And therefore, we, including Pastor Dan up here, who should have been in hell, when God declared us innocent by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's just. Even though it's not fair. Are you listening tonight? See, we, we, we would talk ourselves out of a blessing. We would talk ourselves out of the goodness of God. We would talk ourselves out of the justice of God if we could, but God is saying this is not about what we can think or what we can calculate here on the earth. It's about what he says. The Bible says God is in his holy heavens and he does whatever pleases him. Why? Because it's just, it's right, it's fair. And therefore, justice is when the plan of God is carried out. That's justice. For the life of the believer, you can see the immediate application of this in that when we do the plan of God, we are now operating in his justice. 
Someone else may say, well, that's not fair. That's not right. But you say, but it's just according to what God says. God said it, I believe it, that settles it for me, but now I'm going to carry it out. I'm going to do it. Why? Because God loves justice. And God will make justice to shine like the new day, noonday. God will make it become brighter and brighter. The original word carries the idea of judgment in a court of law. Think about it like this. The, the, the state of California has laws, right? Things that are passed. Things that in a court of law, the gavel comes down and they say, this is how it's going to be. Bang, the speed limit is 65 on the freeway, okay? Now that happened without you or I ever making that decision. That happened before we came along. Here's the signpost on the road. Here's what's going on. And, and, and so therefore, when we see that signpost, a law has been passed. And the law is just. It's the right way. And whether you agree with it or not... When you do it, you are now carrying out justice. Right. Apply this to the Word of God. The Word of God has been around for thousands of years before you and I were ever a twinkle in our mother's eye. Here comes the Word of God, and we start to find out what it says, and we say, well, wait a second. This doesn't feel right. This doesn't compute. This doesn't calculate. This doesn't please my flesh. I would want to work a different way. I don't understand why it has to be that way. I don't understand why God would say don't do this or, or, or do this or, or be this way. And yet when we do the will of God, when it's carried out in our life, that's justice. That's what God is saying. Because why? Because in the high courts of heaven, the gavel has come down. This is the way it's going to be. And therefore, when you do it, you are just. Luke chapter 11, please turn there with me. We see Jesus talking about justice. Luke chapter number 11. There were some guys who were holding to a system, to the Old Testament law. They were very legalistic about it. And they were called the Pharisees. These guys held to the strictest form of the law. And yet Jesus had something to say about them. Jesus said, you guys have got it all wrong. Luke chapter 11, verse number 42. Luke chapter 11, verse number 42, Jesus is speaking and he says this. He says, but woe to you Pharisees. So he's saying, you guys have got this all wrong. Woe to you Pharisees. Why? For you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and look at what they do. And pass by justice and the love of God. And look at how Jesus wraps up his comments. These, what? Justice and the love of God. These, you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. You see, Jesus came under the law. He says, you guys still need to do the law, but don't miss out on what's important. What's important is justice and the love of God. And that's where the heartbeat of tonight is. This guideline for living to do justly is that we ought to do these things. Yes, we can still take a look at the, the commandments. We can take a look at the things in the Bible, you know, like tithing or like other things that we would see in the Bible being loving to our neighbor and that sort of a thing. But ultimately, 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 we need to be just and do justice and hold on to the love of God and not leave the other stuff undone. That seems like a rule or seems like something that we would say, well, yeah, that's not important. Still do that stuff, but make sure it comes out of heart of justice. Make sure it comes out of a love of God flowing in and through you. That's what this is really all about tonight. Tonight, a couple of things to do justly. I'm going to complete that sentence a couple of times as we go through tonight. To do justly. I believe that it will help us to understand this guideline for living. To do justly, number one, is right in God's eyes. We've already discussed this. We've already said a lot about it, but I believe the Word of God has more to say. Turn to me to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter number 21. Back to the Old Testament, Proverbs chapter number 21. Talking about to do justly is right in God's eyes. If it's right in God's eyes, then it's got to be good for me too. Proverbs chapter 21, verse number 3. Proverbs chapter 21, verse number 3. Look at what it says. To do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Wow, that's amazing. To do righteousness and justice is more acceptable. Everybody say more acceptable. more acceptable. Now, see, he didn't say that the other one wasn't acceptable. It was acceptable. 
But to do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Now, now why is this important to us? Oftentimes, we don't understand verses like this because we did not live under the law before we came to Christ. We lived however we wanted to live. We had no law. We just were kind of out there doing our own thing. We had no concept of what took place under the Old Testament system, most of us in this room. And what God is saying is under the Old Testament system, there were a bunch of laws. And if you broke any one of those laws, the way that you were going to cover that sin... The Old Testament calls it atonement. The way you were going to atone or cover for that sin is that you were to bring a sacrifice. You were to bring either a lamb or a ram or there were different sacrifices you could bring. You could bring a a small bird if you didn't have the money for the lamb, that sort of a thing. And so they had different ways of covering that sin and you had to slaughter that animal. And you had to give that sacrifice to the Lord and that sacrifice was the acceptable way to cover that sin. And so what is God saying? God says to do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than to sacrifice, than to cover your sin. Why? Because the sacrifice often involved guilt. Sacrifice often involved shame. Why? Because I screwed up and therefore I need to bring this sacrifice. Oh yeah, there were other sacrifices under the Old Covenant system, the Old Testament system that you brought that wasn't because you messed up. You know, there was the free will offering, there was the peace offering, there was different things that you could bring to the Lord that did not involve sin. But without the right heart, it's worthless. Do you hear what I just said? Without the right heart, it's worthless. See, God would rather have your heart than your gift. Let me say that again. God would rather have your heart than your gift. Why? Because out of your heart, if the love of God is flowing through your your actions and your activities daily and, and you're doing God's ways, God has your heart. God would rather have your heart than your gift. God would rather have you doing justly than messing up and bringing sacrifice. God would rather have you doing justly than to just go through the motions and, oh, I need some favor with God, therefore I'm going to bring him a peace offering or a, or a sacrifice or an offering or a tithe or whatever. God, God's not concerned with any of that. Remember, Jesus said don't neglect that, but at the same time make sure that those weightier matters, justice and the love of God, are flowing in and through you. Like what the Old Testament prophet Amos was saying in Amos chapter number 5. Turn there with me. Amos chapter 5. You go through some of the Old Testament prophets. You were just in Micah. Go from Micah to Jonah to Obadiah backwards, and you'll find Amos. Amos chapter 5. It's on page 1178 in my Bible. Amos chapter number 5, verse number 21 through verse number 24. Some of you guys are saying, well, wait a second. Pastor Dan doesn't have a rock Bible, does he? different in my Bible. What's up with that? (laughs) Amos chapter number 5, verse number 21 through verse number 24. This is how God feels when it's not coming out of a heart of justice. See what's right in God's eyes. Amos chapter 5, verse number 21 says these words. It says, I hate. Just strong words. Next two words, look at this. I despise. Do you think God is angry? I mean, when you read some of this, I I, I picture God is so mad speaking this that it's almost like a parent who's angry at their kids and they can't even get the words out right. You know what I mean? Some of you parents out there know what I'm talking about where you're like, listen, son, and you kind of have to take a breath and then you start up again. I, I, I think that's how God is feeling at this point. He says, I hate, I despise your feast days. And I do not savor your sacred assemblies. Verse 22, though you offer me burnt offerings. Remember, it's more acceptable to do justly than it is to bring a sacrifice. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them. Nor will I regard your fattened peace offerings. Verse 23, take away from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear the melody of your stringed instruments. 
Verse 24, look at this. But let justice run down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. See what God's interested in? Notice he said, I won't hear the melody of your stringed instruments. Why? Because he, he's not listening to the melody of stringed instruments. He's listening to the melody of your heart. And he says, let justice run down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. I, I was, for fun, reading this in the message. You know, a lot of people don't like the message. They say, oh, it's not Bible. Listen, it's somebody's paraphrase. This is how somebody put this together. They read it, and they put it together for their kids. And now for you and I, we can kind of read it and, and get some more understanding out of it. Amos chapter 5, verse 21 through 24, in the message Bible, message paraphrase, says this. I can't stand your religious meetings. I'm fed up with your conferences and conventions I want nothing to do with your religion projects, your pretentious slogans and goals. I'm sick of your fundraising schemes, your public relations and image making. I've had all I can take of your noisy ego music. When was the last time you sang to me? Wow. And then he says these words. Do you know what I want? I want justice. Oceans of it. I want fairness. Rivers of it. That's what I want. That's all I want. I, I think he hit the nail on the head with that one. My goodness. For you and I today, we can understand that terminology. And that's what God is looking for. God is not looking for us to go through the motions. God's not looking for us to come into church with an empty heart and an empty head. And, and oh, everybody else is lifting their hands, so I guess I should too. And they're singing the song. And, you know, we kind of flick a tear every now and then. We get the Holy Ghost goosebumps. And we go out of here and do whatever we want. God is not interested in that at all. God's looking at your heart. God's listening to your heart. And when you sing to him, when you lift your hands to him, when you cry out before him, God is looking on the inside to see if it matches up with the outside my goodness that's what God wants God wants us to do justly and it's right in his eyes number one to do justly is right in God's eyes second thing for tonight to do justly number two is learned and developed number two to do justly is learned and developed somebody say thank God the reason why I say that is because sometimes we think we have to have it all together overnight hear a message like this and you feel bad because you weren't into praise and worship tonight and he's hammering that thing and I don't know what I did wrong and pastor, I, I'm new at this. Well, listen, God's not expecting you to, to, to do this overnight. I heard somebody say it like this one time, it takes time to die on the cross. See, we've been crucified with Christ. It was a process when you were crucified. There was beatings, there was suffering, there was carrying the cross, there was, there was mockings and scourgings. Then you were finally nailed to that cross and you were lifted up and it, you didn't die immediately. It wasn't like, oh, we're up on the cross, boom, you're dead. No, it took time. It takes time to die on the cross. You and I have been crucified with Christ. We've, we've crucified our, our, our lust and our flesh and our passions and desires, and it doesn't happen overnight. Come on, let's take the pressure off, church. Sometimes we've got such a pressure to perform. And I'm not saying don't be passionate. I'm not saying don't be diligent. I'm not saying don't resist and bite and scratch and fight and, and, and resist the devil and, and, and do all that. I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about the pressure and the way we put on ourselves to be perfect. God is looking for a perfect heart that seeks after him and does justly. And God's looking for us to learn this and to develop this in our hearts. God's looking for us to follow him and to grow up spiritually. Listen, it took us however long we were on the earth to grow to where we're at today physically. Spiritually, it takes us time to develop and grow. Why? Because you don't know anything. You get saved, you get a couple scriptures, you think you can take on the world, you get out there, you fall down and you go, what did I do wrong? Listen, you're learning. You're learning, and you're developing, and you're growing. That's why uh, oftentimes you read in the Bible that the Apostle Paul is telling the people, you, you should be teachers by now because of how long you've been at this, because of what you know, but i got to break you back down to the elementary principles. i gotta, I got to feed you milk again. We've we, we, we got to grow up here. That's, that's why you read in the prayers that we would grow spiritually, that we would come into the fullness of the stature of Jesus Christ. That's why you read the prayers that talk about that I want you to be rooted and established, built up, and, and, and then you will be growing and fruitful in your knowledge of God. See, there's a process that we have to go through like anything. We, we know it here on the earth. We understand it. There's foundations. Then you build the structure, and then you put on the, the pretty stuff, right? And you put on all the, all the glitz and the glam and all that. After, you've got a good solid foundation, and after, you've got your infrastructure. 
then you can hang everything else on it. And we understand that naturally, but spiritually, we expect to be Superman overnight. And God is saying, I want you to learn. I want you to grow. I want you to develop this in your heart. You, you, you're going to wonder, am I doing this the right way? Am I going after it the right way? But this is how it works, brick by brick, layer by layer. You come to church, you get one thing, and you start to incorporate it in your heart. You say, oh, that's what God wants from me? Okay, that's a guideline. I'm going I'm to walk according to that. I'm going to do that. I'm going to go God's way. Oh, okay, you're in church and you hear another message. Okay, I got another principle. I got something else I'm going to add to my life. Love how the book of 2 Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1, add to your faith. See, faith is where you start. You believe God. He said, add to your faith what? Goodness. Okay, well, I'm going to start living good. I'm going to start living God's way. Add to your goodness knowledge. Okay, I'm going to learn something about God. And the knowledge, self-control. I'm going to start doing what the Word of God says to self-control, perseverance. I'm going to stand up under it to perseverance. Godliness, the godliness, brotherly kindness, and the brotherly kindness, love. See, it's a process that we go through. You're there in the book of Amos. Turn to the uh, book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter number 1. Isaiah Chapter number one. In Isaiah chapter number one, take a look at what it says in verse number 17. Isaiah chapter number one, verse number 17 says this. It says, learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Wow. God is saying it right there, right there in front of us. Right there in the word of God. Learn. That means you have to get in there and find out how to do this. That means you have to go after it. You have to apply yourself. Learn to do good. Seek. Seek takes time. If you've ever been looking for your keys when you're trying to run out the door, you understand how one minute can be a long, long time, right? And you're, you're going everywhere. You're seeking for it. You're trying to find it. Then you find them under the couch cushion, of course, or wherever the kids left them or where you left them. Or they might even be in your hands sometimes, praise the Lord. <laughs> but you're seeking. What are you doing? You're running around. You're going after it. You're trying to find it. Seek justice. Seek the way of the Lord. Find out what's pleasing to God. Get after it. Go everywhere you can looking for it. And then look what he outlines. A couple of things. Rebuke the oppressor. Rebuke the oppressor. Stand up and say something when something's wrong, is what he says. Do something about it when you know it's unjust. Look what it says. Defend the fatherless. See, there's people that don't know because they never had somebody tell them this is how it is. That's why this church does what we do with our SPTs. That's why this church preaches and teaches so many different messages during the week. That's why we're constantly training people and doing leadership development. That's why we have a Bible college. Why? Because we're trying to help people to grow up in their faith, trying to help people get a hold of this and get built up and strong in the ways of the Lord. Defend the fatherless. Look at what it says. Plead for the widow. Who's the widow? The widow is somebody who doesn't have a husband to take care of her. The widow is somebody who, who doesn't have the means to do this on her own. My goodness, that's why we have feeding programs. That's why we're in the convalescent hospitals. That's why we've got people under the bridges ministering to the homeless. That's why this church does what we do. Why? Because it's just in the eyes of God. And we're carrying out the justice of God, but it didn't happen overnight. We learned how to do this. And we grew in that, and we, we sought the will of the Lord, and we prayed, and we, we fasted, and we tried stuff. And if it worked, it, it was good. If it didn't work, we adjusted and we changed. One of the best ways to learn and to develop this is to talk about it. Talk about it. Open your mouth and talk to somebody about it. Uh, you know, in, in the Old Testament, you read that they were supposed to bind these laws around their hands. And they actually had these things that they put on their, their foreheads. It was a little box that contained the scriptures inside of it. And they would put it up here on their head. And, and also, when, when they walked through their doors of their homes, they had it right there on their doors. And in fact, if you go to Jerusalem today... And you walk through the gate of the city, you will see this massive, massive uh, box up there that contains the scriptures on the inside of it. And people walk by and they kiss it and they rub it. But it doesn't stop there. It goes on to say, talk about it to your husband and wife. Train your kids in this. And we learn a lot of times when we can work things out and speak to somebody about it and tell somebody about it. You know, if you ever have to teach something, You'll learn it real fast. Why? Because you can't teach somebody without learning it yourself. You've got to get it down on the inside of you. 
And so some of you guys need to go home and you need to preach this message to your neighbor. Some of you guys need to preach this message to your kids. Some of you guys who your husband or wife isn't here need to go home and preach this message to your husband or wife. Maybe you could even preach it to the mirror because you might need to hear it again. Hallelujah. I know I do. Praise the Lord. Look at what it says in Psalms 37, verse number 30. The mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom and his tongue talks of justice. Wow. The mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom and his tongue talks of justice. See, we, we can't stay silent about the things of God. We can't just hold this. This is not just our faith. Oh, it's mine. Yes, it is mine, and I own it. But listen, listen, if it's yours, it needs to spill out of you. See, because whatever you put on the inside of you is what's going to come out of you. The Bible says out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So that means that whatever you get deep down on the inside of you, whatever you believe, whatever has been approved in your life and what you know the will of God is and what you know the way of God is, and you're going to carry out that will of God in your life, that plan of God in your life, now you start talking about it. You start to chop it up. You start to digest it. You start to chew on it. You start to meditate on it. You start telling somebody about it. All of a sudden, they come up, well, I read this scripture. Oh, yeah, that's cool, too. Hey, take a look at this. Look at, I was thinking about this and how my life, when I, when I go through this situation, see, it, you can apply it to any situation. What's the justice of God for your marriage? You need to learn. What's the justice of God for your kids? You need to learn. What's the justice of God when it comes to your finances? You need to learn. What's the justice of God when it comes to being in business or, or working with good ethics? What's the justice of God when it comes to, to, to being an influence in the community? See, God's word, God's will, God's way, the laws of God, the precepts of God, the commandments of God that are contained in this Bible, you got to get in there. you got to dig it up. It's like gold. Sometimes you got to go through a lot of stuff to get that one nugget. And once you get it, you polish it. You get rid of all the other the stuff on the side, and you start to polish it off, and you start to find out, hey, this is gold. This is something. This is real. This is, this is worthy. This is valuable, and I'm going to keep it in my life. Tonight, to do justly, number one, is right in God's eyes. Number two, to do justly is learned and developed. Last thing for tonight, to do justly, to do justly comes from godly character. To do justly comes from godly character character. Now, I didn't say comes from our character, because our character, when we were born and raised, is, is natural, it's fleshly. But now we've got the Spirit of God living on the inside of us. And when you have a godly character and you allow the Spirit of God to live His life through you, the Bible says, I, I, I've died now. I've been crucified with Christ, and no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. And the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. That's Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. And so as you allow that godly character to flow out of you, Jesus to live his life through you, that means that you're wearing Jesus, but he's wearing you. My goodness, that's a cool thing. So every morning when you put on your clothes, remind yourself that you're putting on the righteousness of God, that you're putting on his robe, that he's robed you with his righteousness, that, that now you're putting on Jesus. You are wall-to-wall -wall Holy Spirit when you wake up in the morning. But also remember that he's wearing you. He lives on the inside of you, and now he wants to do things in and through you. He's got divine appointments for you. And so the justice of God will flow from your relationship with God. Let's take a look at it in the Word, Genesis chapter number 18. Genesis chapter number 18. And let's take a look at what is said about this man by the name of Abraham. Genesis chapter number 18. Genesis chapter number 18. And just to tell you what's going on, God is about ready to go and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. You say, how could a loving God destroy people? Well, he's just. What we see God doing, God was just in his ways. These people were wicked. These people were committing crazy acts. And yet God knew that Abraham's nephew Lot was there with his family. And take a look at it in Genesis chapter number 18. And actually, 
I'm going to back up. It's not on the overhead, but I just want to read to you part of the verses beforehand because I believe it'll, it'll help us to understand more about what, what's being said. Genesis chapter number 18. I'm going to start in verse number 16. We'll read through verse number 19. 19 will be up on the overheads for you. Genesis 18 verse 16 says, Then the men arose from there and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to send them on the way. So here's Abraham. He's been sitting down having a covenant meal, and, and here he is speaking to God, and there's angels with him, and, and, and that's what it's talking about. Look at verse 17. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Now, hold on a second. Hold on a second. See, there was a promise of God that was given to Abraham that he would be blessed and would be a blessing. And that his seed that came after him would be blessed. So we know that Messiah is going to come out of his line. We know that it's going to be a blessing to all nations. And now on the other side of the cross in the New Testament, we find out that we are Abraham's children. We're a part of that nation. How? By faith. Because Abraham was in faith, believing God, and God accredited to him as righteousness. And so now we, by faith, are a part of that nation. And God says, am I going to hide what I'm doing from Abraham since I promised him some things, and since I'm going to make him a great nation, and since he's going to be a blessing? Now look at verse number 19. Look at what it says. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. What does that mean? That means that God looked at Abraham and he saw a characteristic on the inside of Abraham of faith. And he said, I can trust Abraham with my will. I can trust Abraham with what I'm about to do. Why? Because Abraham is going to train his family out of his godly character to do justice on the earth. Abraham's not going to question me. Abraham's not going to go against me. Abraham is going to create and produce the same godly character in those that come after him. We see this in Isaac. We see this in Jacob. We see this in the generations that come after him. And now we see that same spirit of faith in all those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where this is at. It comes from a godly character. Last verse for tonight. Psalms 106, verse 3. I'll put it up on the overheads for you. Blessed. Everybody say blessed. blessed. Oh, come on. Everybody say blessed. blessed. Blessed are those who keep justice and he who does righteousness at all times. See, when you do the will of God, when you carry out the plan of God in your life and you do justice, there's a blessing that comes. Remember, God said, I know Abraham I know him so well, and I know what I'm going to do. I know I'm going to bless him, and those who come after him will be blessed. All the nations of the earth will be blessed. But look at what it says. Blessed are those who keep justice, and he who does righteousness at all times. What does that mean for you and I? What does that mean for you and I? That means that when we do the will of God, sometimes we don't understand it. Sometimes we take a look at the will of God, and we take a look at the plan of God, and we say, God, I don't understand. God, why would you want me to give that up? God, why would you want me to deny myself? God, why would you give me this passion and this desire, and yet now I have to sacrifice it on the altar? See, there's a lot of questions we have about the plan of God, and yet God says, I'm just. And when you do my will my way, and when you carry out my plan on the earth, now you are doing justice, and there's a blessing on the other side of that. There's a blessing that comes with that. There's something that takes place where you just have that capacity to succeed. That's what being blessed is. God says, when you do my plan, when you carry it out on the earth, even though you don't understand it, even though you don't know why, why do they want me to go 65 when 70 feels so good? God says, when you do that, you're blessed. When you do that, it's a guideline in your life that keeps you from crashing and keeps you going in the direction that you need to go. If you guys got something from the word of the Lord tonight, come on, let's give God a great big praise. <laughs> Woo! Hey, I want to talk to you guys before you leave. You guys have been great tonight. I want to thank you guys for allowing me to speak that message to your heart. And uh, thank you for sticking in there. And, and I really believe that you got something from God tonight. Let's not stop there. Some of you in this room, if you walked out of this place, you died, your heart's not right with God. That was it. God forbid that should happen to anybody. But what if that happened to you tonight? Just, just think about that. You don't have to say anything out loud right now. Just, just focus in on what God is trying to speak to you. What if tonight was your last night here on the earth? You closed your eyes here on earth, opened your eyes in eternity. 
where would you end up? Would you go to heaven? Or would you go to hell? Sometimes people say, well, all roads lead to heaven. Well, no, that's not true. Not all roads lead to heaven. See, that's, that's like saying you can do whatever way you want, but as we learn tonight, justice is God's way. And what's just is what God says. It's not about your way, not about my way, not about some well-meaning church committee's way. It's about God's way. So tonight, come on, let's find out what the will of God is for our lives. Let's find out what the just way to get to heaven is. What is God's way to heaven? Sometimes people say, well, I know that God's way to heaven is by being good. Maybe some of you in this room thought, oh, I'd go to heaven because I'm good been a really good person, been nice to my neighbors, given a lot of money to charities and done a lot of justice missions and things like that. You know, I wear shoes that kids in Africa get shoes to. I drink water that they dig wells in South America. And therefore, I'm a really good person. I used to be bad, cleaned up my act, been doing a lot of good stuff. And therefore, I know God's going to let me into heaven because I'm good. Problem with that thinking is, could you show me in the Bible how good you have to be? Could you show me the grading scale? Is it, is it behind the maps where you be this good or be above this line, you get to go to heaven? It doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible does it say be this good or do this much good and God lets you into heaven. In fact, if you look for the standard of how good you have to be in the Bible, the standard is perfection. No one was perfect except one. His name was Jesus. And therefore, you're not going to get to heaven just by being good. You can't be good enough. Sometimes people think this. Maybe some of you in this room think this. Well, I'm going to get to go to heaven because I was raised in church. My parents told me we were Christians growing up, took me to church, took me to religious classes like Sabbath school or Sunday school or catechism class, hung a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck, had you baptized or christened as a child, and, and, and you were raised in church. We were born in America. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist or Muslim or Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, right? Wrong. Nowhere in the Bible does it say your parents take you to church, call you Christian, that makes you a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you wear religious jewelry, go to religious classes, be born in America, be baptized or Christian as a child, you get to go to heaven. And I don't see anywhere in the Bible that because you're not some other religion, that by default, God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying hell. Listen up, listen up, listen up. That's how you think you're going to get to go to heaven. You're not going to make it. And I love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough tonight to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Some of you might be saying, well, pastor, okay, I understand that, but not only when I was a child did I go to church. Here I am sitting in church tonight, and, and I'm a Christian. That's great. I'm glad you're here tonight, but show that to me in the Bible. You sit in church service, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. Could, could you show that to me in the Bible? It's not there. It's like saying that you can go down to Angel Stadium in Anaheim, sit in the dugout, wear a uniform, bring your bat and your ball, think that you're going to get to play in the game. It doesn't work like that. They're going to find you sitting there, drag you out, and lock you up. Why? Because you're not a part of the Angels organization. And therefore, you can't sit in church, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. It doesn't work like that. Sometimes people say, well, okay, pastor, I understand that. But, but you know, I, my last church, I got involved. I helped out, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. I taught in the Bible classes, even got a membership card to that church. That's great. Glad you did those things. Could you show that to me in the Bible where you get involved in church, help out, sing in the choir, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions. People think of you as a leader, teach in the Bible class, you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible say church involvement gets you into heaven. And again, I don't see anywhere in the Bible God is standing at the gates of heaven looking for your membership card to a church so that you can enter. It doesn't work like that. Come on, tonight, let's love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell the truth. You're not going to make it. Now, some of you are saying at this point, well, but pastor, I know God. I, I know Jesus. I, I know about Easter and the resurrection, celebrate Christmas and sing the songs every year of my life. I, I could quote scriptures to you, tell you stories from the Old and New Testament. I mean, I even knew where Micah and Amos were tonight when you were preaching. That's great. I'm glad you did those things. But show that to me in the Bible where you know something about God. You know who God is. Celebrate a holiday. Can quote scripture or identify books of the Bible. That gets you into heaven. It's not there. Check it out. If you'd read your Bible, you'd know that the Bible says demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The Bible says the devil himself believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and can quote scriptures. Find that in your Bible. And yet he's not a Christian headed for heaven denying hell. So everybody look up at me for a second. It's not about what you have in your head. It's not about having head knowledge or mental assent towards God. But just like we've been saying tonight, this is about your heart. God's always been after your heart. Beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, God is looking for a heart. Jesus said it like this. He said, you must be born again. 
Now, he wasn't talking about a physical thing. He was talking about a heart thing. You must be born again. Now, when he made that statement, he was making it to a very good guy who was a religious leader. Remember, we were talking about the Pharisees. This guy held to the strictest form of the law. He was a good guy, did good things. He was raised up in his church, became a leader. He could quote scripture. He had memorized scripture. He could sing the scripture. And yet, that wasn't what was going to get him into heaven. Jesus didn't pat him on the back and say, hey, man, you're doing a great job. Just keep doing what you're doing, and I'll see you in heaven. No, he doesn't say that at all. He says, you must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term. They've raked it through the coals. But what does being born again mean from the Bible? What does that mean? What is that? Born again. Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. Just that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. Book of Revelation, third chapter, Jesus speaking to a church, just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what is he saying? Lukewarm, what's that all about? Lukewarm? Well, what does that mean? Well, it means a little in, a little out. A little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and then, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not your everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, look out. Why do I say that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Jesus said, if you confess me before men... I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, your call, your choice. In a moment, I'm going to count to three, just like this. One, two, three. And when I say three, I'm going to pop my hands together. Bang! That's your opportunity. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, just like that. Bang! Your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand in this place is you're saying, I want to be born again. I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, whoa, 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 pastor. Wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh Uh-huh, you might be. Get over it. Why do I say that? Because think of of it. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But he also said, if you deny me, I will deny you. So it's your call tonight, your choice. A moment of possible embarrassment for an eternity in hell forever and ever and ever. No one would make that trade. Tonight, come on, let's push past the embarrassment. Let's get our hand up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. Probably won't even be embarrassed. But even if you are, it's better than ending up in hell forever and ever. Listen, if you got into hell, you would raise everything you could, your hands, legs, arms, whatever, your underwear on a flagpole just to get out. But there's no exits in hell. Therefore, tonight, you have an opportunity presented to you. Come on. You can get right with God in a safe and friendly place. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching by television in the foyer or the Love Rock Cafe, get ready to get your hands up. Who should raise their hand? You've been running from God instead of to God. I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand? You're not sure about your salvation. Come on tonight. Make sure before you leave this place. Who should raise their hand? If you've never done this, never given God all your heart in your life, I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Come on. Let's get right with God tonight. Let's go all out for Jesus. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. All together on the count of three. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high. Thank you. There's one. God bless you. Where are you at? Thank you. Anybody else? Real quick. Thank you. God bless you. There's two. There's three. There's four. Thank you. God bless you guys. Anybody else? Real quick. Got four wise people already. You know you need to do this. Need to give God all your heart. Need to give God all of your life. Come on. Where are you at? Number five. You're sitting there wondering if you should. Thank you, number five. God bless you. Anybody else real quick? Five wise people already. Come on. Just raise them up high. Be bold. Thank you. There's six. Gotcha. Anybody else real quick? Six wise people already. Number seven. You're sitting there thinking, man, I, I, I should do this. Come on. Go for it. Just lift your hand up if that's you. You know God just spoke to you. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? Or yeah, just wave it at me a little bit if that's you. You're, oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Thank you. Is that both of you or just one? Both of you. Okay, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Seven, eight. God bless you. Anybody else real quick? Eight wise people already. Anybody else? Come on, you know you need to do this. You know you need to do this. Anybody else? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sweep through one last time. Don't miss this opportunity. You've missed enough opportunities in your life. You're saying, well, I can get saved without doing this. Really? Remember, we talked about the justice of God. God's just way to get into heaven is to give them all of your heart and all of your life. 
That's not just simply raising your hand. You got to do it God's way. So tonight, come on, acknowledge your need for Jesus and then we're going to lead you in a prayer. Anybody else real quick? Eight wise people already. You need to do this. Come on. Thank you up in the family. Nine. Anybody else? Where are you at? Number 10. Come on, number 10. Come on, number 10. Don't, don't be stubborn. Let's do this God's way. Thank you, number 10. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Woo. All right, all 10 of you, don't start off in rebellion. Come on, I'm going to ask you to do something bold. I'm going to ask you to do something brave, but it's good for you, and you need to do this because we want to lead you in a prayer. We want to change destinies tonight. We can't do that till we get you down here. I'm going to ask you in a moment as we stand and sing a song to get your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church. Parents, if your child raised their hand, hey, they're welcome to come on up here. They'll remember this. Make sure to bring them, okay? So... What are we going to do? We're going to all stand, give a clap and a shout as we sing this song. If you raised your hand, or if you should have raised your hand, you come right now. Get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front. Come on, come on, come on. Won't you come just as you are? They're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. You can come too. You can come too. They're coming. They're still coming. Come on. Come on, if you raise your hand, come on. Hallelujah, here they come. Here they come. All right, they're still coming. Come on, you can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Anybody else, if you raise your hand for the family, just come on down. Come on. Listen, we've got about five minutes left, and, and I'm going to ask you guys to do me a favor, okay? Just hang tight for one second, because I believe that God wants to bring some more people down here to join you, okay? All those of you that are out there, if you didn't come yet, I want to encourage you, just come. There's no condemnation. There's no judgment. We're not looking at you like you're a sinner. We're excited for you. We all did this at one point or another, in one way or another. And so, listen. We're asking you to come to life. Come to the love of God. Come to Jesus tonight. So if that's you, I'm going to ask Elijah to sing one more time. Come on, come on, come on. And, and if you need to come, just get your stuff, get in the aisle, and, and get up here. Because the Spirit of God is waiting on you and really wants you to come. God loves you so much. He's, he's holding everything up for you right now. So if you would, Elijah, come on, lead us in that song. And if you need to come, you just come right now. Come on, come on, come on. Just make your way to the front. He'll give you He'll give you strength for today. But well, if you need to come, just come on down. Just taste the living water, and you'll never thirst again. They're coming. Come on, you can come too tonight. You can come too. Anybody else you need to come? Just come on, right now is your time. Just taste living water. Anybody else? Come on, come on, come on, come on. And you'll never thirst again. All right. I'm so excited that you guys came. So happy for you guys. Put a big smile on your face. It's a good thing. It's not a bad thing, okay? You didn't come to die, all right? That old man, that, that old man's going to die, all right? Like we talked about, crucified with Christ. But now the life you live is by faith in the Son of God who died for you. Jesus loves you so much. He died for you. Took your place on the cross. It's a good thing, all right? You come to life, come to heaven, all right? And not now you're denying hell. Now I want you guys over all up front to look over here to my right, your left. This is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave's a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. I'm going to let you know what he's going to do in advance, okay? First thing he's going to do, he's going to lead you in a simple prayer to invite Jesus into your heart, and you're going to be born again, okay? Second thing he's going to do, he's going to give you some free information and some free literature to take home and read about what just happened in your life. Real thin, real simple, real easy to read. You can invest 20, 30 minutes to sit down and read it, find out what just happened in your life and what to do next in your walk with God. Now listen, we, we invest hours into movies, hours into television, hours into video games and telephone conversations, all that kind of stuff. You can invest half hour, 20 minutes if you read fast 
to sit down and find out what to do next in your walk with God. The last thing he's going to do is he's going to introduce you to a friend that we have here in the church called the spiritual personal trainer, okay? Like I said, it's a friend in church that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Now, what they're going to do is they're going to encourage you. There's a program that will describe how it works. It's easy and it's free. You need to do it. Now, I'm going to make a promise to you guys, okay? Here's the promise. You give us one year here at this church, okay? Really, you're giving God one year, okay? Starting your year off right, just doing the things of God, doing the justice of God. Give us one year. Come and learn. Come and grow. Come and develop in the way of the Lord. Then for the rest of your life, you are going to be so blessed that you'll look back and you'll say, oh, yeah, I'm very glad, very glad that I gave that one year. Now, it all starts with five weeks with an SP. SPT, Spiritual Personal Trainer. It's easy, it's free, he'll describe how it works, and then I'll let you come right back out, okay? So if you guys will make a left turn and follow Pastor Dave, let's give him a hand as they go. Woo! Hallelujah!